Em meio às torres medievais da Universidade de Cambridge, no mesmo prédio onde um dia deu aulas o reverenciado economista britânico John Maynard Keynes, trabalha hoje o sul-coreano Ha Jun Chang, pesquisando e orientando alunos de pós-graduação em economia. Ele é autor de dois best-sellers nesta área de conhecimento, Derrubando a Escada e 23 Coisas que Não Nos Contam Sobre o Capitalismo. O primeiro livro já lançado no Brasil, o outro a sair este ano. Chang é o que se costuma chamar de economista heterodoxo. Não segue a cartilha habitual de reverência ao chamado mercado livre, que ele compara à teologia católica na Europa medieval, quer distância dos conceitos que sustentam o neoliberalismo. Ele acredita em política industrial e diz que todos os países ricos a adotaram com vigor na fase de ascensão e continuam a adotá-la disfarçadamente. Chang critica até a sua própria especialidade de economista, recheada de tantos fracassos, que como ele diz em tom de piada, mas nem tanto, se fosse outra profissão, já teria sido banida e seus praticantes enforcados. As we know, there have been several attempts to try to explain the current financial and economic crisis we're going through, and there seems to be, well, at least two theories. One says that the system failed completely. Um, it, it just didn't work. And the other says, no, the, the capitalist system, the free market uh, works. Mm -hmm. It does work, and it just needs a bit of touching here and there, a yeah. bit of regulations. Uh, What's your take? Is the system rotten or is it still uh, the good system? Yeah, well, actually, I'm somewhere in between because I'm one of those people who believe that, yes, uh, capitalism has lots of problems, but uh, as a system, that is, uh, at least as yet, uh, the best economic system that the humanity has invented. But the kind of capitalism that we have had in the last three decades, this uh, neoliberal free market capitalism, that's what has failed. And we obviously need to do certain things to get that right. But I think uh, also there's a bit of a uh, problem in saying that, well, the basic system is okay, it's only the regulation that didn't work. Because uh, in the end, regulation is what defines what the system is, you know. I mean, until 1888, was it, uh, in Brazil, it was totally legal to buy and sell human beings. Yeah? When you Slavery. introduce, exactly, the, the regulation that you cannot do that, they basically abolish the market in slaves. In the same way, you could argue that uh, there were too many complex financial derivatives which were basically dysfunctional. I mean, they, they were good for making money for people who deal with them, but uh, bad for the rest of the society. So you, we could uh, arguably say that uh, we should abolish those markets. That's also regulation, but then you are actually changing the system with those regulations. So I think, uh, yes, I mean, uh, we you know, have to accept that uh, the system has failed, but uh, we need to be clear about exactly what has failed. Is it capitalism in general? Or is it this particular variety of uh, free market capitalism that uh, has been practiced in the last uh, 30 years? In your writings and lectures, you've indicated that the, this form of capitalism that has uh, developed in recent years seems obsessed with maximizing short-term profit yeah. uh, for shareholders, mm -hmm. uh, focusing too much on giving dividends uh, to these shareholders. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then every quarter we have to examine mm -hmm. the profits and all that. Uh, okay, so you criticize that it is a nerve-wracking thing, but isn't that what the companies do anyway, private companies do anyway? Well, that's what we have been told uh, is the case, but you know, this form of uh, capitalism, uh, what is uh, sometimes known as uh, shareholder capitalism, based on the belief that uh, the shareholders own the company and the company managers have to do everything to please their shareholders. This is actually something new, not even in the United States, which is the home of this uh, idea of uh, shareholder capitalism. Companies have been giving away so much of his, uh, th their profits uh, to shareholders, you know, until the 1960s. 
American companies used to give out 40, maybe 50 percent of their profits uh, to shareholders in the form of dividends and share buybacks. In the recent period, American companies have basically given away 90, 95 percent of their profits to the shareholders. So they have very little money to invest and they fall behind in the technology and then they lose uh, competitiveness. Uh, the best example is uh, General Motors, which, you know, people that, that don't realize this, but the collapse of General Motors is as significant as the collapse of the Soviet Union, I would say. Because uh, back in 1955, all the Japanese car companies put together, I think uh, there were 10 or 11 of them at the time, they produced 70,000 cars, eh? 70,000. In the same year, General Motors produced 3.5 million cars. And how does that <laughs> destroy itself into bankruptcy? You know, and uh, looking around the world, countries have uh, invented various mechanisms uh, to control that. For example, in Japan, there's this system of uh, cross-shareholding between friendly companies. So it, uh, always uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of your shares are held by companies that you do business with or your bank or your insurance company. So uh, there's uh, stability in shareholding, so they, they are less uh, susceptible to this uh, short-term pressure. In Germany, they have uh, introduced this uh, two-tier management system where the most important decisions like uh, mergers and take takeovers have to be approved by this uh, supervisory board, which is uh, made up uh, of uh, half management and half unions. You know, your new book, which is doing very well in this market, is about to be published in Brazil. Uh, the original title is 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. Mm -hmm. You've told us a few things already, but uh, tell us a few more of the things that we are not told about. Right. Um, well, the one the thing that uh, is related to what we have been saying is, uh, you know, the, in this book, I call the chapters things, you yeah? know, I mean, it's uh, a bit of uh, word play, but so the chapter the 22, that is uh, thing 22, says that uh, financial markets have to be less rather than more efficient. So what I'm trying to th th say with that uh, paradoxical statement is that Financial markets have become very efficient in the sense that uh, now information flow is instant and yeah, there's a huge uh, global network of uh, the financial market and so on, but it has uh, become efficient for its own sake, but uh, not for the rest of the economy because uh, the trouble is that now the capital flows are so quick, the real economy becomes more and more short-term oriented. So actually, you need to slow down the financial market. And Make that, it less efficient. That's right, yeah. This is uh, what uh, James Tobin, uh, who was uh, the Nobel economics winner of uh, 1984, meant when he said we need to throw in some sand into this uh, wheel of finance. Yeah. Another thing that I talk about uh, in the book uh, is uh, closely related to a very Brazilian issue. That too much focus has been on controlling inflation, which is only one indicator of uh, the stability of the economy, is, is price stability, but how about output stability, employment stability, or financial stability? So actually, if you look at the uh, worldwide data, not just uh, Brazil, despite the fact that inflation has come down, we are now experiencing more and more financial crisis, and you know, every time it gets bigger, you know. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we also have uh, quite a lot of uh, fluctuation in output and so on. So that, uh, there I'm trying to argue that uh, excessively narrow focus on prices make us uh, lose sight of other important things in the, the greater concept of uh, macroeconomic stability. That takes you into a, a, a still another part of your, mm. of your theories and your books and your writings, which is the fact that you say at some stage all the developed countries, the rich countries of today, That's right. practice protectionism mm -hmm. and industrial policy yeah. it, to a substantial degree, and uh, uh, whereas now they keep telling the others not exactly, to do it. Yeah. They've done it. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, what I mean by kicking away the ladder, which was the, the title of, your yeah, title of my the 2002 book, uh, the first book 
work uh, of mine to be translated into uh, Portuguese in Brazil. You know, throughout history, all countries used tariff protection and other means of trade protection, government subsidies, government investment in the infrastructure, creation of uh, state-owned enterprises, regulation of foreign direct investment and so on, and all these measures to basically promote uh, their national economic development. And people don't realize that as much as the internet allow for individual initiatives and all that, mm -mm. the internet is a creation of the state. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's a demonstration of how how the state has yeah. influence in the most capitalist society there is. Which is That's right. No, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you brought that point out because, uh, you know, people don't realize uh, how deeply the American government is involved in the development of American economy. Of course, uh, Americans had, uh, spread this myth that it's a country of free enterprise and minimal government and so on. But, you know, from the beginning, I mean, in the 19th century, America was the most protected economy in the world. You know? What is the, you know, what was uh, the, the, the tariff rate when Brazil was supposedly pursuing import substitution? It was uh, between 30 and 40 percent. Yeah? In America, throughout the 19th century, most of the time, tariff was uh, 40, 50 percent or even above. Yeah? Even the, in the the late 20th century, when American economy became the leading industrial nation and didn't need those uh, protections to develop so-called infant industries, the American government has been deeply involved in promoting new technologies and new industries through funding of research in defense and health. Uh, so, the, for example, if you think about the industries where the Americans have international competitiveness, it's uh, virtually all of them are creation of the American military. You talked about the internet. The computer was uh, initially developed for the Pentagon. The semiconductor was uh, initially funded by the U.S. Navy. Even in the areas like uh, health economics, bioengineering, the American government still finances 30% of uh, pharmaceutical research. So, you know... <laughs> and GPS is the Air Force. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you run out of fingers that, uh, before you yeah, count all of them. A lot of people in Brazil say, well, the path that South Korea took mm. is perhaps what we should have taken. Mm. Do you agree that it could be transferred there, you know, the lessons could be learned. Oh, the are completely you know, different. they are very similar. However, there were two critical differences. One is that Brazil didn't pay as much attention to export as South Korea did. And as a result, whenever the economy started growing, you experienced a balance of payment problem because uh, as a developing country, you need to import a lot of uh, machines and new technology. And oil. Yeah, and of course, that, that, uh, at the time, oil. So that whenever you started growing, you hit the balance of payment uh, problems. Now, South Korea was not uh, unfree of those problems. You know, I mean, uh, don't forget that when the Brazil was uh, hit by the debt crisis, South Korea escaped it just about. I mean, it was the fourth largest foreign debtor in the world at, at the time after Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Yeah? But uh, it uh, built uh, a lot of export industries, so it uh, found it easy to finance uh, all these imports, and uh, people were more willing to lend to it because they knew that uh, this country could export. Now, Brazil, I mean, that, uh, re in relative terms, uh, neglected uh, export industries, so that, that uh, kept uh, creating all these uh, macroeconomic problems, which then ended up in high for inflation. So and the other factor? The other factor is uh, education. No, no, no. I mean, that, that is uh, the, what every country should do. But right. yeah, the interesting difference is that uh, Koreans uh, control foreign investment a lot more heavily than Brazil did. So the Brazil, for example, in developing the car industry, basically work with uh, Ford and Fiat. Yeah? 
but there was no ambition to grow Brazilian technology in automobile. In the Korean case, yes, uh, we also started with uh, joint ventures with Ford, Fiat, and General Motors. But then at some point, in the, to be precise, in the, the, the early 1970s, the government announced that from now on, we want car companies to develop their own models. And any company that isn't willing to do that will cancel the license. By the late 1980s, Korea became one of the six or seven nations in the world that could actually design its own engine. And then now it's uh, that, uh, basically the, the operating with uh, its own technologies. And that, I think, uh, was a crucial difference because uh, the, uh, the Brazilians, of course, in the beginning, it uh, is better to rely on foreign technology because it's uh, superior. Eh? But at some stage, you have to do something. That's right. But uh, Brazil didn't do that. And I think, that, uh, well, in some sectors it did, but uh, in many sectors it didn't. And that, I think, was another crucial difference uh, that made uh, Brazil, which was 50% richer in the uh, early 1960s uh, than South Korea. Now, the Korean income is uh, more than double the, that of Brazil. We're talking about rich South Korea, mm. but you recently wrote that the people in South Korea yeah. are very unhappy to the point of actually committing suicide. That's right. No, unfortunately, yeah. back in 1995, our suicide rate was uh, below the OECD average. Today, it's at uh, three times the OECD average. Since uh, 1997, the Asian financial crisis, we were forced uh, by the IMF and also driven by internal supporters of uh, neoliberalism have adopted uh, neoliberal policies on a massive scale, which has created a huge amount of uh, problems. First, uh, it has exposed uh, the companies uh, to these uh, short-term uh, pressures uh, from the stock market, and it has uh, reduced investment, it has uh, reduced uh, new jobs, reduced the uh, overall growth, on top of that, it has uh, made companies to become more vicious about uh, the workers. I mean, we, of course, uh, never had uh, you know, very nice uh, capitalists uh, in the sense of uh, treating the workers well, but uh, now uh, they it's become... getting worse. Yeah, because uh, they have to create all this uh, short-term profit. How do you do that? I mean, uh, basically sack anyone you can think of and rehire some of those people that you need as uh, agency workers with uh, no protection, no pensions, nothing, and uh, the, the wages at uh, half the level of uh, regular workers. So now we have uh, the highest uh, rate of uh, people without uh, permanent job contract in the OECD. 60% of our workers do not have permanent contract. They are under immense pressure. No wonder they are unhappy. Yeah, and that, that's where you got the, the suicides. Yeah. And all that. Do you think a, a bit of that, especially the, the suicides even, uh, seem to be increasing in, in Europe under this austerity programs? Oh, absolutely, so yeah. think it's a similar phenomenon? Yeah. No, you know, I mean, one... Unfortunate assumption in this standard economic model is that they assume that human beings are like any other commodity. So the, <laughs> the conclusion is that uh, you put more pressure, they'll produce more. Yeah? But uh, we are not like that. I mean, uh, when you make people's life insecure instead of uh, performing better, they get uh, depressed, they become unhappy, and their productivity falls. Yeah? So uh, this is an un unfortunate consequence of uh, treating human beings as a... Uh, as, uh, água potável que o Brasil tem como nenhuma parte do planeta Terra, tudo isso nos obriga a um grande, generoso e fraterno esforço de reunir o Brasil. E é a essa tarefa que eu quero me dedicar. Eu quero, para mim, o lugar na história daquele homem que unindo todos os brasileiros de boa fé, oferece ao país para um momento de medo, de descrença, de desconfiança, a restauração na crença de que essa é uma nação que tem tudo para fazer o mundo admirar de pé o nosso esforço. O que nós temos aqui, isso sim, é uma classe dirigente ordinária. Esta é a grande verdade. Desculpe o termo duro, mas essa é a grande verdade. Elites e classes dirigentes no setor público e no setor privado. 
que precisam reexaminar a sua conduta. Querem manter o povo brasileiro miserável, atrasado, ignorante, doente, pobre, para poder ter um trabalho vil e com isso manter os seus privilégios. Como essa de privatização, de cada vez mais liberdade, desse quadro viu, de roubalheira internacional e nacional que existe no nosso país. Está saneando, engordando as economias dos países ricos. Nós precisamos defender a economia nacional, essencialmente, defender a economia nacional e levar o padrão de vida do povo brasileiro. Custe o que custar, isto tem que ocorrer. Salvar as nossas crianças, Sr. Maxu, é a coisa mais urgente que pode haver. Para mim, o Brasil não teria muitas das coisas que estão aí fazendo e gastando dinheiro, entendeu? Coisas para uma, um fragmento de luxo da vida brasileira. Enquanto nossas crianças estão aí, desdentadas, doentes, cheias de parasitas, submergidas na ignorância. Prioridade número um deste país, salvar as nossas crianças. Compreende, mundo afora, na alguma experiência que pude por aí adquirir, como é que um país que tem a maior fronteira agrícola por explorar do planeta, um país aonde... No mesmo dia, podem-se produzir culturas de latitudes temperadas, como o trigo, o centeio, a cevada, ou culturas de clima tropical, como a uva, como o milho, como o feijão, ou culturas de cerrado, como a soja, que faz a pujança de parte importante da economia rural brasileira, na mesma data. E não faço isso para mencionar individualmente ninguém, Tal é a emoção especial que sinto. Como se explica que um país autossuficiente em petróleo, um país que tem a matriz energética mais limpa e barata do planeta e ainda não exaliu sequer metade do seu potencial hidráulico, um país que imediatamente a sucessão de uma crise nessa, nesse padrão de consumo insustentável que é a civilização do petróleo, rapidamente seja nos pioneiros do etanol, Seja agora pelo biodiesel de diversas oleagens novas, não só produz para si, mas oferece um sinal para o mundo de alternativas, de mais do que uma alternativa de combustível, uma alternativa de um outro modo de tratar a natureza que já não aguenta mais a inconsequência do ser humano movido a egoísmo, a lucro de curto prazo e a nossa nosso planeta, por isto, dá sinais de uma agonia que tem que ser...